Yeah, ma'am, we're ready. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll begin. Good evening, everyone, and greetings from the School of Languages, St. Joseph's College. On behalf of our principal, Father Dr. Victor Lobo, our rector, Father Dr. Spiebert de Silva, the management, and the School of Languages, we welcome all the participants this evening, both on the Zoom and the YouTube platforms. A special welcome to both our speakers. I will be telling you about your speaker, the speakers in a bit. This is day four of our colloquium titled Recovering Intentions, Reconnoitering uh, Prospects, a Colloquium on Languages, Undergraduate Education, and the National Education Policy. Yesterday, we listened to two speakers from the academia, Professors V.S. Sridhara and Vanamala Vishwanatha. This evening, too, we will be listening to two speakers, Ms. K. Meena, writer and journalist, and Mr. Nazarius Manoharan, a life skills trainer. Uh, let me now introduce the first speaker for the evening, Ms. K. Meena, a Bangalore-based journalist, author, and journalism teacher, who also edits and occasionally functions as a writing coach. She's worked for the City Tab and Deccan Herald, before co-founding the Asian College of Journalism in Bangalore and later going freelance. She's also written three novels and has co-authored a book on adoption. This was published by Joan Quinn and a book on disability and inclusion in India, which is to be published in November by Hatchet India. Um, the talk for her session is titled Language is Everything in Journalism. Uh, Meena will be talking about her ACJ experience. She will be describing the language abilities and limitations of the students who have studied there, who've done a diploma course there. She will also be talking about the various gaps. And uh, she will also be telling us about how important it is to retain languages all through the degree course. We're very happy uh, to have you with us, uh, Meena. It's always a pleasure to see you to welcome you and to have you. you in our midst. So we're looking forward to listening to you. So over to you, Meena, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Oh, okay. So uh, I've also been listening to the last two days, you know, the kind of speakers, and I realized that today is going to be a very different session, right? people who are really not from the mainstream academic field, right? So uh, I come from a different place, a place different from the other speakers like Sridhara, Vanamala, Avinash, you know? So uh, it's, you people are really doing the real teaching. That's what I think. You know, when I used to teach at ACJ, I used to always think, uh, okay, Am I really being a teacher? Because the kinds of students who come to ACJ are really the ones who are quite proficient in, in the language. Whereas uh, the people uh, who we've listened to over the past couple of days, they've been doing the real heavy lifting, right? It's been such a heterogeneous group of people that you get with different abilities, uh, facilities for language, and you have to guide them, support them, you know, put them through various streams, a lot of hard work. So you really are doing the slogging. But before uh, uh, I tell you about uh, my experiences at ACJ and uh, how that would uh, link to the use of language, right, I'd like to make a few brief comments about what I've heard in the past couple of days, okay? So hearing the other speakers, I think I'm even more convinced than I have been that uh, it's disastrous to stop with just one year of language, just two semesters, you know? Because we've seen, we've heard, and we are aware how crucial English language teaching is to every undergraduate student. I mean, whatever be the discipline. As uh, Avinash was describing it, he was talking about the decontextualized, sanitized workbooks that teach skill sets, which cannot replace the language component. And he added that linguistic skills are required, whatever be your subject. That's true. 
I mean, be it commerce or science or medicine, engineering, whatever. You need language. And uh, Sridhara, for instance, mentioned how you need language when you write your thesis, your research papers. You know, you would, you would need it, whatever your field may be. I was also wondering, I mean, aren't all these STEM subjects taught in English? Aren't the textbooks in English? Uh, I, I suppose there are, uh, you know, European countries where they would probably teach these subjects, mathematics in French or German or whatever. It's easily translatable, right? The terms and whatever, but we are doing all our teaching in, in this language, right? So yesterday, uh, those of you who listened yesterday, and especially where uh, had also waited to listen to the questions and answers, you might have, uh, when after Vanmala was uh, speaking, uh, she was a little puzzled by a question that came up from, I think it's somebody called Satya Pagash, I'm not sure. Okay, there was a comment that he had put saying, uh, well, I'm a statistics person. So, you know, you are talking about translating texts from different Indian languages. So, in a sense, how would that help me? So, Varmala was puzzled. She said, I don't understand the question, but I think I can uh, explain it. You know, I think I know where the gentleman is coming from. What he means is, what's the use? I mean, I'm just dealing with numbers, statistics. So, why should I go through all the bother of, you know, knowing about stories and, you know, translations from, uh, of texts from different languages, right? I think that's what he meant. And if so, if so, then I have a counter question. Hmm? I mean, is uh, your entire life statistics? When you go home to your family, do you talk statistics? Don't you live in a society, in an environment? Aren't you interacting with people? It's not through statistics, right? So I was... <laughs> Uh, you know, I wish uh, I had been able to sort of uh, type in a response, but then technology, you know, I couldn't chat. I think I was on, I was on YouTube and everybody else was on Zoom. So quest, the response wasn't coming forward in the little chat box anyway. So I, I just wanted to refer to that in this context, right? Where, uh, you know, as uh, Vanamala was saying, citing Jean Hutchison, that the language model where information is predominant, the other way language is used for interaction and persuasion, not so much as, you know, information. And Sridhara later mentioned that, you know, only through language can a critical mindset be developed. And you need that for everyone, whether you're a statistician or an economist or, you know, don't, don't scientists need to be critical? Don't they need to think of the implications of what they're doing? So, uh, you know, language therefore plays the central role in everything, right? So I think that is something that we don't need to, uh, at least those of us who are here on the Zoom session don't need any convincing, I think, right? So now let me come to journalism. Speaking of critical thinking, and language, I suppose this is where both are crucial. This is an area where both are crucial. Now this, uh, to give you a little background before I tell you about the kind of uh, teaching and the kind of students or trainees as we call them, journalism trainees that, who were there at ACJ. Let me kind of give you a little background of uh, the college itself which is the brainchild of uh, TJS George, the veteran journalist, but it was started by the Indian Express group. Then it was just one Indian Express. Now it's split into two. Uh, the Indian Express group, they had the BD Goenka Foundation and they wanted to start this uh, course, a nine month postgraduate diploma course in print journalism. We were very specific about what our objectives were and you know, uh, what was the area we wanted to cover. And uh, this college ran, by the way, from the Indian Express building on Queens Road 
two floors. We occupied two floors of one of the uh, sections of their premises. So it was a nine month course and uh, you might, since this was the 1990s, we started it in 94, we ran it for six years in Bangalore until it was taken over by another management in Chennai and then it left Bangalore. So I uh, was associated and also helped found it uh, here in Bangalore for six years. So uh, you might uh, perhaps be astonished at the kind of fees we were charging. Uh, the first year it was 9,000 rupees for this course. And then we raised it to 12,000 and then staff were very alarmed. We said, how can people afford it? And then it was raised to 15, which was like the limit, you know? So of course, once it moved to Chennai, the fee was one lakh. So just to give you a perspective, so uh, now the, the, uh, the aim really of this course was to uh, create uh, a trainee, giving him or her hands-on practical training, right? We were talking of skill sets yesterday, but these are journalistic skills we're talking about, right? And uh, training so that at the end of nine months, the trainee would be equivalent to, can match the competence of somebody who's been in a newspaper working for three years. I mean, this is what our aim was. And uh, I suppose in today's terms, you know, the, the words that we've been using, we didn't use it then. It was basically vocational, job-oriented, I guess you could call it that now. And uh, the focus was not just on uh, language and communication, but journalistic skills, right? So they had to go through the whole discipline, meeting deadlines, you know, knowing how to interview people, reporting, editing, page design, you know, journalistic ethics. So it covered the whole gamut, but extremely intensive and hands-on. So there was an internship after six months, they would intern for a newspaper for a month. And what would happen usually was that the publication would tell them, hey, when is your course getting over? Come back. You know, that used to be the <laughs> response for many of our interns. So obviously what happened was at the end of the nine months, there were campus interviews, uh, papers would send their representatives and before the convocation, all jobs snapped up, you know, everybody would be employed. So that used to be the kind of, uh, you know, course we used to run. So clearly to run such a thing, you know, a student, the kind of students, right? So this is where I think I will start using certain dirty words such as meritocracy, sadly, we did focus only on, uh, you know, merit when we were choosing students. So diversity, you know, inclusion, no, none of those things featured because the idea in our minds then was we got to make a name for ourselves. So we have to get the best, you know, this was the, this, this was the aim, right? Have to get the best. So, which means that, you know, we are not going to struggle like all of you English language teachers, you know, uh, teaching them fundas, the basics. As somebody said yesterday, uh, I forget who it was, that uh, he was shocked that even a third standard level uh, English paper, they couldn't answer, right? People failed that. So we don't, we wanted to specifically choose those whose competence was pretty, pretty high, right? So that, uh, so our students came from all over India, by the way. Excuse me. And their backgrounds, social backgrounds, yes. They'd be either solid middle class, middle middle or upper middle. They'd come sometimes from metros, other cities, occasionally small towns, right? But, uh, English medium education. 
not necessarily the best schools or colleges, not like uh, they're not all, you know, Sophia's and Jadavpur, et cetera, but, you know, uh, a sound education, which we could make out when we started selecting them, right? This is the way in which we selected them, the method. And by the way, let me tell you, they were not all English major types, no. Many of them were from the sciences, right? Commerce, science, whatever. They were from various backgrounds. So they're not all BA English or, or even uh, humanities, right? They weren't. So they came from uh, others, you know, they had other subjects as well for their degree. In fact, I remember uh, one guy was, I think, agriculture and fisheries, if I'm not mistaken. But he turned out to be one of our best writers. Okay, so so that's the uh, kind of background they came from, and our method of choosing the students. Now, this is again what I said, right? Looking at uh, merit, how are we going to get the best talent? This is what we wanted to. Uh, this was our aim. So uh, now. There was no time for, like you said, uh, in, like I said earlier, uh, we had a really, really tough test. We had tests in various entrance tests in various centers. So the Indian Express came in handy there because they have branches, right? They have editions all over. So usually their offices were the test centers. And, uh, you know, obviously we put out ads again, no problem. People applied, they sat for the test. The two kinds of uh, qualities that we tested them on. One was obviously, since they're going to be journalists, how aware are they of current events? So which means news, general awareness, right? What uh, a version of what you might call GK today, but really focused on uh, current events, news, you know, let's see how aware they are. The other was English. And that was a, a very rigorous you know, kind of test. And we used to joke that, uh, you know, if you give this test to the uh, regular newspaper reporters and sub editors, I have a feeling they won't be able to ace it. So we really focused on, this is where we sadly weeded them out, right? This is the whole meritocracy business, okay? So which means that there was punctuation, grammar, syntax, you know, there were objective and subjective type questions. So that was a great delight, you know, designing these <laughs> question papers. So, uh, you know, so we were uh, looking at uh, fundamentals, right? And uh, so, which means that once the papers came back to us, we selected out of some 200 odd or whatever, I forget the exact number. Of them, we would, have, uh, what shall I say, uh, select really, marking them and giving weightage, more weightage to the English than the general awareness. For, for example, somebody's scored a little less in, in uh, current events, but is very good in English, we'd say, okay, they can catch up. We'll make them you know, read the news and be up to date, but that component is crucial when it comes to journalism, right? So we, select, we would select about 40 of them and uh, call them for an interview for a viva. And of them, we'd have 20, not more than 20, sometimes 15, 16, 18, but 20 was the limit. So we had to <laughs> take 40 of the best and then get more. Yeah, Are you, can you hear me? Did somebody just say no, something? I think that was a mistake. Oh. So uh, the, the amusing thing is we would, uh, one of the questions we would ask them was obviously, what is the last book you read? You won't believe how many of them would cite a degree English text, okay? So, so remember that, uh, you know, even all of these, you know, really elite students, you might call it from coming from uh, very, you know, privileged backgrounds, uh, they were not necessarily widely read or well read, right? So uh, some of them were, uh, you know, really literary minded, but not all of them. So they would be quoting the last book that they studied in college, 
when asked, what book did you read last? English book, right? <laughs> now, uh, we also ran a parallel course. After a few years, we started a Kannada journalism side by side. And that, of course, was uh, very interesting because, um, as you can imagine, their social backgrounds were radically different. They came from different parts of Karnataka, from rural areas, small towns, very few from Bangalore. I barely, I can uh, count them on my fingers, you know, one fingers on one hand. So villages, small towns, and class differences obviously were there between the English walas and the, <laughs> the Canada trainees. Uh, they came from farming families, some from really uh, economically weak, uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, background. And, uh, but this, you know, mixing of uh, the languages, you know, the bilingual thing was good for both of them, you know. So there was no, there was no, you know, uh, you're sort of isolated. There was just that initial hesitation and then immediately, after all, these are youngsters, you, you know, and uh, they, they become a single group. Now, uh, one of you was talking yesterday, I think uh, we were referring to it constantly talking about, you know, social reality context, right? So when it comes to a grounding in hard social reality, there's, uh, you know, nothing can beat journalism really, the, it, the way it should be taught and the way it should be uh, practiced, I guess. You know, so that we were, hello, can you hear me? It says internet connection unstable. We can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, yeah. But, uh, am I getting, uh, am I getting uh, oh. interrupted? No, ma'am, it's okay. It's a little patchy, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's my not voice. Okay. We can still hear you. Patchy, huh? But you can, you can make out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Like, uh, you don't want me to switch off video or anything, no? Do you want me to? I can do that. No, ma'am, it's all right. Okay. I'll let you know if there's an issue. All right. Okay, okay, got it. Uh, so where was I? Yes, talking about social realities. So this was grassroots reporting, really, that they had to do. So uh, actually, the students from up north were quite amazed at how, you know, language was not an issue in Bangalore. Right. I wonder if this college was in any other place. Right now it's in Chennai. I wonder how they, you know, they'd be, they would have managed all these years. But here they said, man, we can manage with Hindi. <laughs> and of course, the students from the trainees from Chennai said, yeah, Tamil, absolutely. Everybody knows it. So in that sense, you know, language became uh, not an issue when they went out reporting. But this was solid grassroots reporting that they did. So here again, whatever backgrounds they came from, they got to know uh, Bangalore that was not uh, similar to what they had experienced perhaps in their own cities as well, right? The areas they would go to. So at first, of course, when they wanted to take a break, weekend break, where would they go? You know, I know. <laughs> MG Road, Road right? So interestingly, not the Canada speaking students, not the Canada trainees, right? So they were absolutely at home here. They could go meet, whatever. So they, these people had to be nudged, pushed towards, well, these are not the kinds of stories that you're doing, you know, going and uh, interviewing the English speaking types, no. So then, you know, uh, but, but they, they, they were, uh, there was no reluctance, obviously, but then, uh, yes, go and, you know, go to a city market, go to Rajajinagar, go to Jayanagar, you know, uh, you are going to be finding out what are the lives of your auto drivers, your parking attendants, your vegetable vendors, your tailors, your cobblers, you know, uh, owners of Kirana stores, hardware stores, these are the sort of people, you know, uh, whom you should be acquainted with, right? So in that sense, you know, there was, there was a sort of a, uh, a kind of, a, what shall I say? 
coming out of their comfort zone, really, right? And which they enjoyed, which they enjoyed. So in that sense, you know, when you were, uh, we were discussing uh, texts which should reflect reality, this was a way of really immersing them, you know, and that's the way it should be, you know, wherever they are teaching journalism, that's what it should be. Whatever we may say about the state of journalism today, oh, look at the kind of reports and the reporting and the subjects that they're talking about, you know, all the Fs, the fashion, food, you know, <laughs> fitness kind of thing. But this is really, uh, you can see, therefore, the when we spoke about what language does, what it exposes you to, right? Interaction. So this was a way in which this profession can do this for them, right? So it can open up despite uh, choosing all of these students from uh, these uh, really privileged, relatively privileged backgrounds. What happens is that isn't there a, there's a good side to it, right? So you take any of those hundred odd students of mine, they are not going to be having the kind of attitudes that, you know, the regressive kind of attitudes that you might find among those who are well off and who don't need to think about what's happening beyond their nose, beyond their doorstep, right? So uh, this is something, and of course, we who taught there, obviously we're all of the same mind. So, uh, you know, we made sure, uh, you know, where we come from. So uh, just as uh, yesterday we were discussing, it's not ideology, but you know, all of us were sort of, everybody was talking about that, right? Where is it that we come from? What, what do we stand for? We made no bones about that. So we're very clear about that. So now uh, there was a very interesting component here, which uh, my colleague Ram Krishna, he had a brilliant idea and uh, what these st students from outside Bangalore would get when they came here. And this was happened after three years when Ram joined us, uh, was an introduction to Karnataka so that they'll, they'll kind of get, get the sense of what the state stands for, right? So it's literature, it's music, it's dance. So they would be exposed, people would bring people, right? So this was great uh, learning and fun for them, right? So it's heritage, everything about it. So they kind of got a crash course the, in the very first month that they came. So they'd get a sense of where they are, you know? So th that was uh, very well designed and Ram was mainly, you know, responsible for that. So that was uh, a lovely kind of an introduction for the outsiders, right? Uh, the way in which they, we got them to work, uh, the hands-on part of it, right? The training, they had to uh, bring out a newspaper. So once they got their initial lessons in how do you report, you know, how do you write a feature, how do you edit, which is of course a very crucial skill that they need, right? Uh, which is again advanced, you know, even more than reporters, editors need to be uh, the ones with a greater competency and knowledge, right? So they brought out uh, a tabloid uh, newspaper, four sheeter. So we would increase the frequency as the months went past. So starting off with once a week and then twice a week. So it increased the frequency and towards the very end of the course, they would bring it out for 10 days every day, right? We, of course, we were fortunate because the express was just there. So uh, they all had desktops right? No laptops those days, desktops and a dot matrix printer. And, you know, so, and they would go running to express to do the, the, the printing part of it. They'd be in touch there, find out what's the right time, etc. So they were working, right? And it was called the word, by the way. So yesterday, somebody was quoting one, one, one uh, in the beginning was, was the word. So our tagline for the word was, in the beginning is the word. So, uh, because that's where it all starts, right? So this was uh, their, uh, uh, you know, they had to learn to meet deadlines. So that discipline came in, right? 
And of course, uh, I enjoyed buying red refills for my pen because uh, once the paper came out, then the postmortem, that's, that's the term we use in newspaper jargon, the postmortem. So uh, in the class, right, each of us, the three of us, uh, the Dean Jyoti Sanyal, the late Jyoti Sanyal and Ram and me. So we'll point out errors. So you might, of course, uh, think that, well, here are these people with great proficiency, fluency, everything, right? And they would have learned it pretty quickly because we're choosing the best, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so there can't have been that many errors, mistakes, goof ups, right? The were. Besides page design, by the way, they had to also learn to obviously make pages. So that's another uh, area where they were taught the principles of page design. Besides that, the words, the word uh, has to be perfect, right? So uh, you would imagine what, uh, uh, perhaps you can't really predict, what would be the first lesson that we taught all of these English speaking journalism trainees? Well, typing, you know, you see, they could all, they knew the keyboard, yes. But I realized pretty soon, and this is something that I started, they kind of looked at me in amazement at first. I said, okay, end of the day, fine, class is over. Uh, all of you, type two paragraphs and give it to me. Take the printout, dot matrix printout. Simple lesson, right? Take the newspaper type three paras and show it to everybody before you go. So they go and type, right? And I'd say, listen, what are these three spaces doing? How many spaces after a full stop? Stop, single space, start the next sentence, right? What are these spaces doing before the full stop? A space before the comma, no space after the comma. So they would sort of, you know, they. they they, so I said, I mean, do you realize what would a newspaper or a book look like if you had odd spaces, odd kind of way? You, so that is a basic discipline that you that you need here, right? And of course, I realized that uh, it comes to, uh, it, it, it is something that should be kept in mind even if you're writing your thesis or your research paper, right? But here is something where you have to be particularly careful. So I said, you know, your boo-boos are not going to be seen by the public tomorrow, right? So spacing, line spacing, paragraphs, how many spaces? So you have a tab for the, you know, so you have to maintain that very basic, you know, uh, discipline, which it didn't occur to people, right? So I said, do you think a sub-editor is going to sit and correct this when you uh, give in your report? I, I mean, he or she's got uh, tons of other work to do and, you know, a page to design and your report comes in and then you have, is he going to sit and fill up, delete space and correct paragraphs? So, you know, this, this, this was an area where, you know, it, it was kind of unpredictable, but it uh, made a huge difference, really, because, you know, you sort of get into that whole mindset and so clearly, uh, you might wonder when they went for the internship, what is it that uh, you know got these newspaper you know editors and senior uh, chief reporters and all of them to say come back? Well, the speed with which they would convert uh, news in brief, right? There is something called briefs. I don't know how many newspapers have it, but all papers used to have these little briefs items. So you would get all this rough copy and then you're supposed to convert it into like two lines. So they'd do that. The engagements column, right? So, you know, so these are, these, this is not like great stuff for breaking stories. That is not on, the only thing that journalism is, right? And these kids had, these trainees had learned that. And they were so appreciative that, you know, they knew how to, how the paper runs and this is how you should do it. So this business of cutting out the verbiage, getting to the nub of things, right? How do you make it concise? The whole ABC of it. 
what we call accuracy, brevity, brevity and clarity, right? That is the basic. So those who came, in fact, from BA English major, uh, you know, backgrounds had a greater difficulty because the purple prose would come when they write the features. So, you know, that's when the editing had to be learned, had to happen, right? So, uh, now, oh yeah, we, punctuation, I talked about that. The Canada trainees now, uh, after they uh, came in here, uh, now, what we did, this was a, another pretty brilliant idea. Rajaram, I don't know if you're listening, but he took English speaking sessions for the Kannada students. This is some uh, uh, a request that came one year and then we realized the value of it, specifically when it comes to journalism. So let me explain what happens or imagine that you're working in a Kannada paper and uh, you are, let's say going to meet somebody uh, who doesn't speak Kannada, who only speaks English. What happens if there is a person visiting from abroad, from Europe, from the US, from wherever, right? What do you do? And this is an important person. Maybe it's a Nobel laureate, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a scientist, an astronomer, a musician. No language? How, how do you ask questions? How do you, you know? So what used to happen often, I don't know if it still happens, was that uh, Deccan and Prajavani were sister publications, right? So you would come here, the, the DH person would hand over a copy of the copy, right? To uh, Prajavani and it gets translated. But then, uh, so therefore, this uh, became really, very really useful for our Kannada trainees. They could go anywhere and not hesitate to ask questions. Is that, the, let's say, this press conference, it's not even a one-on-one, -on -one, let's say. And they have to raise a question. And it happens to be a non-Kannada space. What do they do? So they got that confidence from these lovely weekly sessions that Rajaram used to take with them, right? One hour uh, of... Uh, conversing. So he, he explained how the syntax works as well, how it's different in Indian languages, they say languages, as opposed to English. And they were able to get the hang of it, right? So while the Kannada trainees were uh, very much, you know, a part of the family when it came to their uh, other trainees, the English trainees, uh, th this was an area where they, they, they felt a lack, right? So this helped. A great deal and I think it's a specific problem I think for uh, when it comes to journalism where you need this you you, you can't do without it right uh, so uh, I was just wondering whether it, well I've spoken for quite a bit actually Arul you told me 25 minutes 20 25 I've sort of overshot so uh, I was wondering if there are any are there any questions coming in and especially since Naz is supposed to come in at, uh, I think, another five minutes. Hmm? So is there anything that any of you want to ask me or anyone else? There are no questions as of now. Huh. <coughs> uh, if there are questions, please post your questions on the chat box. Would you want to conclude what you were saying? You were saying. Ah, yeah, I, will, I was actually kind of uh, thinking about, well. I suppose when, you know, since the, uh, the topic here is the NEP, this only marginally relates to it, right? But I was only uh, kind of emphasizing that 
uh, you know, even if you take a group like this, which are apparently, you know, really highly competent in English, they still have a lot to learn when it comes to journalism, right? Mm -hmm. So if they hadn't had, let's say these, these trainees, they didn't have English, you know, uh, during their degree, they were from other subjects. Could they have, would they have, uh, don't you think those texts that they learned in their degree, don't you think that that seeped into them, right? It was not just the school education, which is crucial. It's true. That's where uh, much of the language, you know, competency comes from. It's true. So if you don't have that basic grounding, it's a struggle in college. It's a real struggle. And you all would have seen that. But even then, I mean, uh, I simply cannot understand how, you know, uh, people who are struggling with this language that we are, that has been <laughs> foisted upon all of us, right, in a sense, and that which we've struggled with and have tried to master, right? How is it that somebody from a very different background comes in there and just gets, what is the use of just having a year, of just having two semesters of some, uh, of, of a language and then just saying workbooks, skill sets, you know, and you've seen how that, how useless that can be, right? Uh, if you just narrow it down to a workbook or, yeah. you know, somebody dictating answers. So yeah. I just wanted to sort of, this, this was my only point, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Meena, while you were talking about your experience of, uh, <laughs> you know, students who've not read books when you've yes. asked them, um, yes at the ACJ, I, it's not very different from uh, what's happening. The ground reality in undergraduate education is also the same. Uh, yeah. Despite yeah. their four semesters mm. of English, mm. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's still so difficult for many of them to actually start reading. Correct. So when they come Correct. to college, they would have read very little. So they start reading once they, yeah. you know, are in classes and we talk to them about books and our English classes and right. language classes it definitely right. helps them to, you know, open themselves yes. out to reading and how crucial Correct. it is to read. Um, yes. So if, if uh, languages are going to go away in that se sense, yeah. and it's only going to be language, you know, skill sets, then, skill sets yeah. uh, then what happens to this reading that is so important to writing, to journalism, to anything Correct. else? Anything else, right? yes. Yes. So um, when we're looking at the NEP, it, it is kind of doing away with this whole thing which we're talking exactly. about and how exactly. important it is. Yes. Um, so what what is the scope? Do you think there's any scope with students who are you know going to exit and uh -huh. uh, perhaps get into maybe some kind of writing, okay, uh, or in the uh, field of journalism? What what do you see? I don't uh, think that sounds feasible at all. That after a year, you know, you sort of exit and then you try, no. Unfortunately, they would. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, newspaper, uh, you know, jobs. If if you exit after a year of degree and then try and approach, unless you are super, you know, a, a fantastic writer, <laughs> or you can convince somebody. No, and you also know that there is this, uh, you know, journalism course that also gets some weight, right? If you've done a journalism course after your degree, okay then of course you, you're considered. But otherwise, if somebody who has come in from a certain stream of an undergraduate course, and after a year or two, tries to look for a job in journalism, I think extremely dim the prospects. No, okay. I, I, I would certainly say so. Yeah, all right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if there are questions, uh, I request the participants to post your questions, both on the Zoom platform and the YouTube platform. Or if you have any comments that you would uh, you like to make or you want to ask Meena questions, please do so. Uh, hi, Meena. I found yeah. two things of interest. Mm. Okay. Kind of also, mm. uh, common ground and common experience, mm. uh, given the fact that we did a little bit of collaboration yeah. on the, uh, mm -hmm. with this kind of thing at Joseph's. Right. right. So right. one of the interesting mm. things in the narrative you are offering us is that uh, very often with uh, uh, Manmohan Singh Ira yeah. course designs, mm. right? like mm -hmm. uh, the ACJ one. And uh, in fact, journalism, English journalism and psychology, which is one of the key yeah. Bangalore University combinations, yeah. right? really mm -hmm. began taking off after 1991. Mm -hmm. right? 
But uh, one of the key factors in the design of such courses, mm. uh, post-liberalization courses, mm. seems to have been the uh, a design which started with uh, necessarily ambitious higher order skills mm. and then went through a revision where a bunch of mm. other basic skills which were seen as, you know, uh, mm. things that graduates would have, yeah. right, had to enter mm. the mix. Right? Such, so as? We're talking, so, like, such as the things you're talking about, you know, huh, learning huh, to type, huh. learning to punctuate. Correct, 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 correct. correct. Yeah. Your, your, your narrative offers a kind of uh, a need to uh, correct course or, mm. you know, revise mm. expectations mm-hmm. of some kind. Right? Mm-hmm. So that, that part is very illuminating because okay. uh, what it offers us is the sense yeah. of uh, the, uh, the fact that there is very little one can actually take for granted in terms of language yes. acquisition. Correct, correct, uh, correct. How much people acquire consciously and unconsciously in second language yeah. acquisition. Yeah. So some things uh, have to be activated, as you were pointing yes. out. Yes, yes. Okay. The right. thing that I'm curious about mm. uh, is, uh, this was a time when uh, print culture was much yes. more of a common sort of experience. Exactly. Yes. You know, yes. in a in a zone where people are multiliterate. Correct. A buzzword, mm-hmm. right? They may not read English so much or write in English so much. Yeah. But they're encountering English because of WhatsApp forwards and because Correct. they're on social media, because the social media, yes. Connected yes. much more Correct. than earlier. Mm. Right? So uh, my Simple question, my curious question here is, mm-hmm. if you were doing the ACJ experience all over again now, uh, your answer probably would be, I won't do it again, but uh, no. if, you were, no, it if you were doing it again, <laughs> you were doing it again and you were yeah. dealing with these uh, students who yes. are multiliterate in this Correct, way. correct. Not much reading, not much writing, but correct. they know English through all these various other correct, uh, correct. You know, uh, yeah. formats and media. Yes. Uh, what yes. would you do differently? Well, uh, for a start, I think I, <laughs> like you said earlier, I wouldn't be there, <laughs> right? Because I am not used to that world at all. And as you well know, I have avoided social media like the plague. So, but the thing is, uh, I think at uh, uh, Mounts, they're t- trying out these things, these, you know, this, this sort of flash fiction, this kind of 40 word stories, this, uh, you know, uh, writing, uh, I'm writing blogs, obviously, uh, things like that. So, so I suppose those kinds of components would very, you know, will come into it, right? Where uh, I suppose language itself would change, right? But here I'm only speaking of, uh, well, I am speaking of journalism. So it is still a tradition bound kind of a thing, but although they have, things going on online. Do you know that uh, reporters today do post things? You know, they have their own handles. So if you're a Deccan Herald reporter, you know, you do your story here, but then you put out a little video. So they've been encouraged to do things like this. I've actually seen this happening to a former student of mine who's in DH now, who's editing Sunday Herald. So uh, this is an additional thing which they have acquired and uh, this is in addition to the report that comes out in your paper, which still does, you know, land with a, not a thud, with a little flutter outside our door because the newspapers are getting thinner and thinner. Uh, so it's it's still there, but this is an additional kind of a thing which uh, uh, you would really new, have to do. In the 90s, of course, we were calling it new media, you know, so new media was the cause that was the, name given <laughs> sounds dated today but i guess uh, it has to be somebody who is you know well has a not just a f- both feet planted but who's actually swimming in this whole uh, newer way of uh, you know communication who has to handle courses like this so i would be the wrong person i think i might be able to get a little idea here and there but no not not, not me sir <laughs> i just like to point out uh, uh, yeah I mean, I'd just like to share mm. my appreciation of one of the things you're talking about, mm. that when you say flash, flash fiction and things mm. like that, yeah, what we're yeah. actually talking about is a kind of language game approach. Right? Mm. 
teach the old skills and the new skills. Yes, yes. New familiarities. Right, right. That's very valuable. Right. Yeah. Let's take a picture of journalism. So, uh, but for a start, for for that again, there has to be the the comfort, the ease, right? You can twist and turn and have different languages coming in, and you can change your English fine. But that inventiveness hmm. also requires a certain okay. basic, you know. Amphibious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. So. Okay. I think yeah. there's a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's there some are... question that vanished. Yeah, there's I, a question that's come up. Okay. Can I read that? Please, please Can do. formal <laughs> education ever bridge the academia industry divide? In your last experience, is mainstream academia chewing more than it can swallow in the context of bridging this divide, becoming more market friendly, etc.? This question is from Roshan. Mm, but which uh, are you talking? Uh, I'm wondering whether you're talking of a specific kind. If, if you're only talking of journalism, that's different. But this seems to be a general question, right? Yes, but that is something that uh, uh, I think has been is being tried out in all colleges in all kinds of subjects, right? How how do you? <clears throat> this is a much larger question, I think, right? Whether you can, uh, f f uh, well, it's a whole thing of practice, right? For example, I in the past did a journalism course, right? It was a BS communication, Bachelor of Science in Communication from Bangalore University. Was that in any way linked to my first job? <laughs> it had very little resemblance. So, you know, you sort of realize what happens. There's nothing like, you know, getting into a, a job. Well, that's sort of learning on the job. But then for that, do you have mentors, right, there? If, if, if not, you know, you, you have to make the best of it. But then definitely there is, there is a gap, as, at least as far as this uh, field is concerned, but that has been is being bridged by making it much more practical oriented, right? Which is what we try to do, and I think which is what other uh, institutions which teach journalism, for for example, IIJNN, I think they're doing that. You know, they're trying to uh, do this so that they can ease into the industry. For, newspaper also is an industry, of course, so uh, they 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 can do that but obviously in other kinds of subjects i have no idea how they would do it but they're trying i think thank you Mina. yeah uh, i i don't know whether that question was uh, particularly okay. addressing journalism or if it was a uh -huh. general question oh it's a general question i think yeah i know so are there any more questions yeah okay, general, general. General. Right. yeah 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 to everyone in fact so unless Rishi, are there any questions on YouTube? No, ma'am, there aren't any. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. there are no more questions. All right. Uh, oh, no, I, I probably just a last word for Roshan. Yeah, sure. That uh, a, a well designed course, a formal, edu in formal education, a well designed course can. Uh, make that entry easier. So you have to look at what is expected of you from the other side, from, if you call it the employer, the industry, right? So that, if you create that bridge, it is possible in certain subjects to have people from us, uh, the field, you know, interacting and uh, making that part of your course, right? But so that there is a, that that's the only bridge I can see. Yeah. yeah. But in the new in the mm. NEP policy, the new one, mm. there mm. seems to be no bridge of that sort because there's no oh. conversation, there's no dialogue of what is Correct. going to happen, how how things are going to you know change in the job market. So when these okay. students are going uh, out of college, exit, huh. uh, you know, after a year oh, or two, then, then what happens to them? Yeah. So yeah. that is I the think they're just left in the lurch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions. Yeah, all right. Uh, we like okay. to thank you so much, Meena. It's always a great, great pleasure to listen to you. Uh, yeah. You know, when you are with us in a board of studies or, or otherwise at St. Joseph's mm -hmm. College, the Department of English, School of Languages, thanks you immensely. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. Can we go ahead with our next speaker? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. So the next speaker for this evening is Mr. Nazarius Manoharan, advertising and brand consultant, executive coach, and therapist. Nazarius has immense experience in corporate training in leadership, effective communication, problem solving, decision making, meeting facilitation, innovation, critical and creative thinking, storytelling, brand building, entrepreneurship, copywriting, etc. For over 29 years now with IBM, Grindwell, Norton, Weston, Bosch, Timkin, Nextier, JWT, Oracle Financials, etc. Nazarius also teaches a master's program in creative digital marketing at Manipal University in critical and creative thinking. In fact, the last program was held between October 2020 and February 2021. So he likes to call this session Languages, Relevance and Reinvention, an Industry Perspective. So Nazarius, a very warm welcome to you as we in the department and his close friends fondly call him Naz. So welcome once again. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you with us and to listen to you. So over to you, Naz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... <laughs> and uh, uh, sorry about the listing of things that you did. <laughs> it was a, I didn't mean for that to be read out like that. So anyway, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I listened to uh, Meena. Thank you very much. And uh, it is always enlightening to hear uh, you talk about, you know, your stories in journalism, the founding uh, of Asian, uh, uh, Asian School of Journalism and the other things of basics, it's always, uh, uh, you know, uh, lovely to hear those stories and how you all went about it. So thank you for that. And uh, I listened to a couple of speakers earlier, uh, which is uh, Sridhara and Vanamala. And uh, they were so, um, you know, it was a humbling experience. I learned so much about uh, things. They were so incisive, uh, eloquent uh, too about their critique uh, of the NEP. So mine will not be so much a critique of the NEP, and I'll tell you where I'm taking it from here. But um, uh, before that, in, uh, I'd, I'd like to take you through a story, and we'll begin with a story if that's uh, okay with you guys. Uh, it leads to whatever uh, you know, we're going to be talking about. So typically we start with the bell, and you may be wondering, who the bell tolls, and then we start with this. There was, there was, there was a tiny mosquito, very tiny mosquito, and deep, deep, deep inside its nostril lived a king and a queen. And the king and the queen had two beautiful daughters. One's name was Truth and the other, his name was Tori. They were about 18 and 19. But they were always fighting with each other. And the argument was about who is the most popular of the two. One day they decided to settle this whole score and they said, let's go to the nearest village in the kingdom and we will both take turns to walk from one end of the village to the other, which is not too far. Yeah, it was a small village. And we will see who to who, how the people would respond and how, whether who is the most popular in, by uh, looking at how the people responded to each of their presence in the village. And so the date was set and they went and the elder sister, whose name was Truth said, I'll go first. She was quite confident that she would win. And she was the most popular of the two sisters. And she started. She opened the door in the inn which they were living for the night. They did not know that the, the people in the village did not know that they were the uh, royalty. And so the, she was very beautiful and she walked out of the house and she went to the main street in the village, which was a long road until the end of that village almost. And she walked. And as she walked, to her surprise, even though she was extremely beautiful, people started moving away from her. And as she walked further, 
they moved into their houses and into their shops. And as she walked further, they further moved away as far as they could from her. In desperation, as she reached the end of the turn where she had to turn back and walk back that same path, she said, let me do something. I'm really crestfallen and you know this is not going too well for me. So she decided, I am going to drop all my clothes and she turns around naked and walks back. And this time, to her even bigger surprise, people bolted their doors and covered their windows and absolutely empty the streets were. She walked back and she was dejected and absolutely downcast. She came to her sister and said, her sister's story, and she said, I think you won. There's no way. <clears throat> that I'm going to ever uh, beat you. Even if you just stroll across, even if one person comes, you're the winner. So the sister said, don't fret, but let me just walk. And she put on a mantle and she walked. And as she walked, slowly the people who were stuck inside closed and barred their windows and gates came out and they started milling around. And as she walked further, more people joined in. It became like a procession and then like a festival. And then there was music and drumming. And as she walked back, the entire village was on the road. And then when she came back home and she entered the room, she looked at her sister, Truth. And Truth said, it's, Truth was weeping. She said, clearly you're the winner. And she, the sister story said, just, a minute. It's not about me, story. It's very simple. I tell you the secret. And Truth said, what could that secret be that I already don't know? <clears throat> you know, you were clearly popular. She says, come with me. And then she took out her mantle of story and laid it on her sister, whose name was Truth. And she said, now you walk. And when Truth walked with a mantle of story, Again, the people started milling around and coming close to her. And then it was the same celebration as what, as when Story walked. And she came back and she said, what is it? What happened? And Story had this to say to her, her sister. She said, you know, sister, people are afraid of the truth and more so of the naked truth. But when you clothe it in Story, it is more acceptable and people are able to digest it. And that's what just happened. So in the story, if you replace story with language, it's absolutely the same metaphor. And uh, of course, story is a part of language. It's one component of language, right? It's a very important component of language. And in industry, we use story quite a bit, whether it's for a corporation, for a product, anything to do with the market is to do with buying and selling. And to sell or to buy, you need influence, you need to persuade, you need to speak, you need to write, yeah? It is language. A lot of it is, has to do with language, yeah? So I just wanted to leave you with that metaphor. And metaphors mm -hmm. are powerful. Language is everywhere, whether you're a physicist or a management student or a mathematician, like Meena just said, textbooks are written. I was a great student um, up till the year, uh, my sixth standard or seventh standard. The only reason for that was I was good, very competent in English. Therefore, I got good marks in science and maths. Do you see the correlation? There's a huge correlation. Because I could read the textbooks better, I could understand the teacher better, the nuances of how the teacher spoke. A lot of them were Anglo Indians. Yeah. So I, you see the, how my competence in another uh, sphere like science increased. Of course, I didn't keep up the thing thanks to sports and interest in other cultural things, yeah. It, just like radioactive elements, I decayed. I decayed uh, not so rapidly, but gradually uh, until college when it was a very different story. So NEP, as far as what I am talking about, I'm taking it as a given, yeah, which means, um, you know, I, I come from the context of uh, a Buddhist context. I'd like to share that with you, which is whenever there is something wrong externally, the Buddhist philosophy suggests 
you need to look internally and the external will take care of itself. I'm using the same approach. I'm suggesting using the same approach for any people because I'm not going to get into is capitalism good, lays off by capitalism, uh, what about climate change? Those are there. I'm not saying you should not fight for it. By all means, fight till your last drop of blood to what you believe in. And a lot of things are wrong. But what I'm saying is, what can we do about it? And this is something that we do in therapy. And I learned that from David Burns. David Burns is a leading uh, cognitive behavior therapist. Yeah, he's written two wonderful books, Feeling Good, Feeling Great. His suggestion, and this would be a useful thing for anybody who listens, especially youngsters, which is never ask the question, why? Why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, why is this happening? Why is the world such a chaotic place? Yeah, there's a good academic questions. It's a great question for learning and knowledge. But when you want to do something about it, when you ask the why question, he says you still remain in the victimhood. You still remain within the problem. What's a better question to ask? He suggests what? What can I do about it? What can I do to take it further? What can I do to take it one step further? And that's the question I'm suggesting that we ask in the context of NEP. Let's say they did this. Language has got much, much more scope than they probably imagined, or they deliberately kind of ignoring it because uh, I think it's the second, uh, it's the latter. Um, so, which brings me to this uh, uh, whole roomy quote, which is yesterday I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wiser and I want to change myself. Yeah. So that's the context of the whole first part of my uh, presentation today to you. Uh, uh, it's about um, the, uh, the relevance and the latter part is about the reinvention. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about relevance. If you treat NEP as a trigger, although every year I think we should ask this question of what can I do better? How can I improve this? And language is, is no exception. All people in all walks of life need to ask that question and they'll improve, right? It's a very, uh, it's a no brainer. So NEP is just a trigger for this session. I'm treating it as a trigger. And it says, how am I still relevant? What's the question to ask? What can I do to become better? Yeah, am I still relevant? How am I relevant to the people in the sciences? Like some stat statistician asked the question. Yeah, it's a good question to answer for our own selves and, uh, and for, uh, to expand the scope of what languages can do. Yeah. Um, so first of all, accept and what is not in your control, we just place it aside, we'll come to it. Okay, we can find changes for that. But what is within our control is what I'm going to be talking about. Right. So when you ask the question, how am I relevant, which I'll come to, but I'll talk about the relevance in terms of the background context. Context, as uh, Professor Sridhar said, is extremely important. And even when I'm doing design thinking, which for most of my life I was, I've been doing in advertising, which is creative ideas, I'm, uh, I'm in the creative field. Uh, I started as a writer. Um, so filmmaking and all that. We start with context. Context is extremely important. And in critical thinking, as well as in literature, context is important. So that's what I want to talk about first, which is uh, um, which will lead to probably some kind of uh, transformation, exponential growth and stuff like that. Let's look at some examples here. Yeah? Like for instance, when you're talking about, ask the question, Walkman, what next? We're great, we're doing fine. The Walkman, everybody knows the Walkman, right? The Sony Walkman, now, most people would have forgotten it by now. The, the answer people some some people came up with is not a better better Walkman. They came up with an iPod, which is a completely different type of technology. It was an out of the box lateral solution. Yeah, we're talking about critical thinking, right? One is convergent thinking, divergent thinking, and then there's lateral thinking, which is a mix of both. Yeah, convergent as in analytical thinking, divergent as in creative thinking, etc. Yeah, so languages language uses critical thinking. But uh, I have to humbly disagree uh, because of, uh, I mean, language is not the only thing which teaches you critical thinking. Critical thinking can be learned. I myself teach a critical thinking course for digital, uh, you can teach it anywhere. You can touch it, teach it as part of philosophy, part of management. Critical thinking involves divergent and convergent thinking and, uh, you know, lateral thinking. And there are a lot of subdivisions to that. Yeah, of biases, um, uh, diversity, uh, how to um, uh, reasoning. 
um, and what are some of the uh, pitfalls of those things. Those are all uh, under critical thinking. So language it does use critical thinking, does train you for it uh, very well, but there are other aspects to critical thinking. Um, nevertheless, we are still continuing to think about language does not need to talk heavily about critical thinking. It still has its virtues and that's what I'm coming to. I spoke about Walkman versus an iPod. Just look at a horse carriage versus a car, which they were called an iron horse, right? It was completely a single combustion engine. Yeah, phenomenal invention, which changed the way our, our world is today. Take a few other ones like the landline to the cell phone, completely different technology. Um, uh, the Kodak film versus you know a digital uh, camera today, completely different technology, revolutionizes. That's what I mean by exponential growth. So there is an opportunity always, although none of us like change. Yeah, there is an opportunity to drastically shift the way we are perceived without losing out on our core strengths and our core uh, uh, what we do well. Yeah, we just need to add to that or package it, repackage it. Uh, I'm using marketing terms now. Repackage it in different ways so that we still remain relevant. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So the first part of that, I would like to uh, talk about metaphor. It's a very uh, intrinsic uh, part of uh, a language. Yeah, uh, metaphor. Uh, probably one of the most, uh, this is a quote, is probably one of the most fertile power possessed by man. It's said by Ortigo Gasset, a philosopher, a Spanish philosopher, between, you know, 1955, I mean, he passed away. The key to metaphorical thinking, as you all know, is similarities, right? It has to, you know, it has to do with what is familiar to us. Yeah, it's a phenomenal piece of uh, tool in learning or learning. We learn about the unknown using something that we know, using the known. It's such a, and language is replete, yeah, rife with metaphorical uh, thinking, right, in many forms. Um, let's take an example, the Danish uh, uh, um, physicist, Niels Bohr, I'm sure you're familiar with him, his model of the atom. He compared it to the solar system for the first time. He said the sun is like a nucleus and all the other planets are like electrons moving around. It is completely uh, new. He used a simple analogy or a metaphor, if you like. Yeah. So similarly, uh, some languages are more uh, imagery oriented, like Hebrew is considered a very, you know, uh, very um, uh, a lot of metaphors and a lot of uh, uh, very imagery and very um, visual type of language. Yeah. Um, when you look at language uh, doing those type of things, it's doing much more than passing on information as we discussed. And we all know that a language does more, more than that, but we just look at a few examples as we are going through this uh, uh, session. So what is language um, used for? To inform, to express, to imagine, to fantasize, to persuade, to influence, to tell stories. It's used in business, products, corporations. It's the economic engine Storytelling is the economic engine. We need stories to uh, make people persuade people and to influence them. Politics uses persuasion to influence people. It is speech. It is the written word. Yeah, it's all around language. And uh, yes, language can be used only as a skill. You they make it bare bones, you know, and say no, no, this is technical writing. For instance, it's bare bone language. Even there, like Mina pointed out earlier, a human being is not unidimensional. Yeah. We are talking about uh, multidisciplinary approaches. A human being is multidisciplinary in many ways. And uh, today, I think in India, even our pets are bilingual, right? Your dog understands, my dog understands two, two languages, two and a half languages, yeah? And bad language in all the languages. <laughs> so what are we talking about? It's a very pluralistic society that we live in. And um, as a leader, as a manager, as an industry, whether to relate, to bond, uh, uh, like, like you said, whether it is a, a provision stores guy, a tailor, or my own employees, I need more than two languages to be convincing, to be authentic, to be genuine. And what if, if leadership is not genuine, or authentic, then what? So what is my bridge? For that, I need to understand emotion, feelings, which is all to do with what literature is all about. What is literature about? It's by stories about uh, emotion, about conflict, about love, about hate, about war, about peace, right? 
What was Tolstoy talking about? What is Anna Karenina about? What's, what was Raskolnikov's guilt about? Yeah, crime. And uh, what, what, what was Kafka's existential price or, or Camus for that minute? Activist and then says, no, I think I have to commit suicide. Phenomenal learnings from other people's lives, which was put into language. So I will ultimately come to language, how to use language to study various things, because one of my friend's uh, wife, Sri Vidya, Nigel Joseph, is uh, uh, from Hyderabad Central University, who's both on Canada, and Sri Vidya is also a doctorate from there. She did her PhD in, um, uh, uh, in, in literature through dance literature, which is Kumaraswamy and all those people. Very interesting uh, thing. That is what I'm suggesting as one of the alternatives when we are going to go to the you know, reinvention part. Using the literature of film, the literature of dance, the literature of uh, music to, uh, 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 as the uh, text for people to talk about, uh, to learn language or to take nuances of what you need to understand about the ethical nature, the moral nature, or, or about uh, societies, customs, whatever you need to know. Yeah, it's a great platform. So in that context, I'll come more detail to how a science graduate like me, how did it help me? I ended up learning about four languages, which is about, yeah, I did three years of French, four years of, uh, three years of German, four years of French, a little bit of Hindi, and I think I'm not good at any one of them at the moment, except um, yeah, I speak English, just about managed to speak it, yeah, Tamil, all these languages. But what did I get from that? I got from that the worldview, of that people from their cuisine, from their culture. And I'm not trying to intellectualize it. I really mean it in very, very small ways. But those small things add up, you know. And to me, it seems like life is a little too short. <laughs> and uh, those nuances refined whatever refinement that uh, I have managed to reach with great difficulty up to now, which is not much. But it helped me to get there. Otherwise, I could have been extremely, a very different person, yeah? So I attributed to uh, a language a great deal, yeah? Not only me, there are many others, but uh, me too, right? Let's go from metaphor to um, uh, future context, yeah? When we use future context, what is the future context that we're talking language in from 2020 to, uh, let's say, the next uh, 40 years? We're talking about the intellectuals of today, like, for instance, uh, Yuval Noah Harari or Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist who got an economics award, yeah, behavioral economics. He's a psychologist, but there's no uh, Nobel Prize for psychology. So he got it in behavioral economics, which is they said, economics, you can give him a Nobel Prize. What was that? And it was about biases. It was about buying behavior and stuff like that. But these two intellectuals, just to put it in a nutshell, I'm not going to name all the intellectuals. Uh, modern day, you will know Harari is very sure. There are three major things that will play a big role in how we uh, make decisions and how our society will unfold. One is collaboration. The second is creativity. And the third is empathy. Collaboration, creativity, empathy. Big, big pillars, right? So far, we were talking about cooperation versus competition. He says, boss, there's no way out. There's impending doom with climate change and stuff like that. You guys need to think fast and act fast. Yeah. And uh, thinking slow, thinking fast. Uh, uh, a landmark book in how a lot of research in cognitive sciences, all pointing towards language and growth in cognitive uh, thing with children is well known, right? From Piaget's time, right? Well known, the, uh, the uh, connection. Uh, between language and growth and cognitive growth. And that's what I spoke about earlier in my experience. Um, it was proven. And uh, so we also speak in advertising, we always speak about the visual language. Yeah? It's a language, it's a symbolic language. We talk about film grammar. We speak about uh, body language. These are all relevant things. And I'm not trying to mix up anything. Of course, it's, uh, you know, when you say, imagine language itself. In cognitive psychology, we study this, right? Squiggles, dots, dashes on a book. In a second, you understand the deepest emotion that is being expressed in that. And how can human beings do that? And that's what we worry about when it is cognitive sciences. But language is ubiquitous. It is all over the place. <laughs> yes, it is in the sciences. 
And yes, we use uh, 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 languages which Japanese use Japanese, Germans use German. Uh, we in India, because of the colonial hangover, we use language. And Mahesh Datani once told me that, um, yes, uh, you know, I write in English. I have no choice. I am a child of this uh, amalgamation, yeah, which happened. And I just write. I have to. I cannot hold it back. And I write into English, I get asked, oh, you know, as a writer, how do you, you know, don't, don't you know your mother, mother tongue? If you can, great. And that's one of the reasons why we need to preserve some of these things like Kannada and Tamil and all our mother tongues and our state languages, as people spoke earlier. It, 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 uh, it is embedded in that is a worldview, a culture, nuances. And everything is not about a job, right? Everything is not about a market. It is. But I would look at a blend and I would like people to choose, students to choose, both make it available, but we will choose. Determine just one direction because they're funding it, yeah? That's the big thing about universities. Am I free? Who's funding it? How are the teachers? The teacher's ballgame is completely different. It's ridiculous to be talking about education and all these things without saying that, wow, we need quality teachers and therefore how much aid? What is the value? about teacher. I, I uh, quote the Finnish model about <laughs> teachers are paid more than uh, or on par with IT people in Finland. Uh, I think it's a great lesson for the entire world for us to know uh, how that is. That's the value you place. And that's something that would it would great to be, uh, you know, to arrive at that place sometime sooner than later in our society too. Uh, yeah, so future is the context. And um, Professor Vanamala uh, 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 spoke about uh, Wittgenstein who famously said, limits of language is limits of understanding. Just a small example, just to push that a little further. If you take the word which describes mind, there are about 30 different words in Sanskrit, which, what does it mean? And in English, you'll find about five words, the nuances of the mind. Yeah, clever, intelligent, mind, uh, stuff like that. What is the meaning of 30 different, uh, almost 30 or more? The nuances that we understand the concepts of mind, various concepts of mind, yeah, it's fantastic. And when you talk about concepts of the mind, it reminds me Robert Persig in his book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Riding, talks about, um, uh, I think it was Einstein, he mentions a scientist who talks about, oh, you see, um, uh, you, you tell the village people that you see ghosts, you're superstitious, you see ghosts. Uh, how are you different as a scientist? You're seeing ghosts in a different form. An atom is just a concept. It's a ghost in your head. It was startling, the, uh, the analogy and the truth behind that. It is true. It just seems a little more sophisticated, but it's essentially the same thing. It doesn't really exist, right? And yet you look down upon one and you don't look up, uh, uh, you know, don't look down upon another. Um, this is just for you, for your reflection. And uh, moving on, what about... Yeah, I already mentioned about it. Communication. That's the field I'm involved in. So I couldn't, language is hugely involved in effective communication. Right? What are the, con what are the uh, uh, elements of communication? Reading, writing, speaking, uh, um, informing, influencing, persuading, all these are part of what communication is, right? So how does it help science to do this? It's always asked, this question was always asked. It's always lurking, it's the elephant in the room, right? We've already answered it write better papers, articulate your the theories better. In fact, the Nobel Prize is given for simple and elegant experiments, and therefore the simple and elegant way you express them. Yeah, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, therefore, it's a good example. Einstein got his uh, uh, Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect, not for his theory of relativity, which was at the time probably a little too early. Yeah, that can also happen. You can be too early, uh, you know, uh, it's just uh, uh, too early for people to know how great it was. And that happened with that theory of relativity. Um, industry needs, what does industry need? Apprentices. When was the first apprentice? 16th century, let's go back a little bit. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, there was no authorship before Michelangelo's time. You had a guild of sculptors and everybody worked on it. So there was no one single owner of a sculpture. It would belong to the guild of Michelangelo, belong to the guild of, uh, uh, you know, Da Vinci because he was one of the senior uh, sculptors. But it did not, there was no one author. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel and thus was born, in a way, 
probably the first origin of authorship as we know it today. And today we say, who's the author? Who's the author? Whose idea was it? Whose idea was it? It need not be. And that's what collaboration is about, about respect for each other and not going into digging out who originated this idea because it can bounce off anything and come up. You will not be able to trace a good idea. And I know that in advertising, it happens a lot when we are ideating. And that's one of the fun things. So we are moving, evolving, even in advertising as who is the author of this, whose idea was it into a team of people who consists of a, uh, a cook, a bullfighter, a woman who works on the street uh, and a completely eclectic bunch of people. The richer the ideas, that's what we found. Yeah, Ask the great agencies, They've tried this model. The guys, you did one immense, uh, uh, I mean, innumerable awards for Nike. Uh, I forget the name of the agency at the moment. Wyden Kennedy, I'm talking about. That's the model that they use. Okay, so then what next? What, what about um, leaders? What do leaders need? Leaders need to bond, to inspire, to motivate, to speak. So multilingual is great. They need to tell stories of the brand, stories of their culture. How does this happen? It's the same thing as we talk around the fire. It's the same nuances of understanding the moral, the values, the emotion, the feelings, all which language brings so beautifully and uh, eloquently uh, uh, is manifested in language. Yeah. It speaks about itself also very eloquently, you know, about, the, about its own importance and critiques it. So uh, why Shakespeare? Yeah, that's a question we've all asked when we were earlier. How relevant is that? What's a science student doing with that? I'll tell you. I'm a bit of a fan of Shakespeare. Drama, structure, conflict, story, social situation. Um, how did a king think? Wow, it's interesting. Julius Caesar, he said this. He could have said this. Yes, imagination, nuances of human condition. Yeah, thoughts fantastically brought together. Not only Shakespeare, one of the guys, but yeah, very well done by him. There, there are phenomenal examples in uh, Indian literature, whether it's Rabindranath Tagore or in Kannada literature, Tamil literature, fantastic people. The whole worldview, how you understand this, if you know the language, it comes alive even more. Yeah, That's why they had a great problem when they're translating Rabindranath Tagore's, will I lose? How much of it will I lose? There are words, you know, I, I want to tell you words where, uh, which are untranslatable. World, world einsam geit, <laughs> world einsam geit. Yeah, it means the feeling of solitude and connectedness to nature when being alone in the woods. Weltanschauung is another word, which worldview it means. It's not quite accurate. Yeah, uh, ikigai is another word, which means purpose and meaning. It's not accurate, but it, it means so much more. These are all to do with language. And therefore, what is language is rooted in our customs, right? It's rooted in food, it's rooted in culture, which is a broad word, but there's a lot of small nuances to it. It's, it's in your clothes, it's in your mannerisms. Ayo, being accepted by the Oxford, they think, ah, it's, it's just a tokenism, yeah? But why? Because somebody, our language is extremely organic, right? We know this by now, yeah? How do young people speak, yeah? That's why they're asking questions about why Shakespeare? It's our job how to make it relevant, but not keep on going to the past. It's, there is a place for heritage and tradition. Very, uh, Joseph Campbell speaks about, so we need that bridge, but not always remain here or only that, but a great blend. So I'm a great uh, fan of this blend of the, you know, what is relevant, what is uh, uh, reinvention and uh, what is old and what is new and how the combination of these things brings about beautiful new things and uh, changes. Um, finally, uh, yeah, I just wanted to leave you with some thoughts of uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, Eat, Pray, Love. She said, people have, you can either have a job, a career or a calling, don't mix up the three. And what she calls is a job, okay? Something that you do to make a living and to uh, keep your calling and your passion fires burning. Career is something that you're a little more serious, more time, and you're committed. So if you get it wrong, you're done for it. Most of your life, you get used up. With. So she says, I'm always between a job and a calling. Today, writing is my calling, you know, which means I'm making money out of it, but it might run out and I'll go back 
to a job. And I have no problem because the world is, the way it is structured is already like that. So I'm not fighting with that. Urban structures are like that. I need a job. So I have no qualms about it. I, I might be a little bit unhappy, but I'm okay. But I'll still do that to keep my other passion growing. I thought it was a great way for youngsters to this model to keep it going because we are either black or white type of situation where you have to choose one versus the other. All my life, I've, I've never chosen uh, fully, <laughs> not a great example, but I'm just saying, I'm just sharing my um, how, how it happened for me. I, I uh, resonate with that uh, quite a bit. Mm, so I leave that with you for a reflection. And all these thoughts of uh, globalization, which was disastrous, has been disastrous. It has some advantages, but mostly disadvantages. Uh, climate change is purely because of globalization. And let me not go into the detail of it. It destroys local cultures, right? Uh, I don't want to sound like an activist. Uh, I do listen to voices of uh, reason from, oh, what benefits did I do? It's like checking out uh, Western medicine. Oh, it's brought you, you know, to the like. There is a lot, part, lot, uh, large part of Western medicine is good, but you cannot ignore the indigenous medicine. Today, it is coming back in a big way. Yeah. So these are all changes which are happening worldwide. The wisdom of the East is given a little more weightage. Yeah. And uh, finally, about uh, not finally, uh, Bronowski, Ascent of Man, spoke about the opposition, the precise opposition of the forefinger and the thumb. This, he believes, led to tool making, creativity, and therefore the front part of our brain to grow. Yeah. That is the. Uh, um, uh, where the uh, intellect, uh, I mean, uh, reasoning power, the cognitive things are all in the front part of the, it's called the neo, neocortex, yeah, the new, new brain. Um, I would say, just below that, language, language helps you do, do something similar. It gives you a competence right at the foundational level for whatever you want to do in life. You want to be a great mathematician. If you want to specialize, of course, when you talk about specialization and generalization, I can't help but going back to Cardinal Newman, who's, who was for generalization. The idea of a university is not about specialization, but we specialized, over specialized in today's world. Yeah. We are so specialized that uh, we have uh, the, uh, you know, uh, Big Brother watching you. Yeah. Pegasus. <laughs> and uh, 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 governments want to get involved with the social engineering because change uh, 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 curriculum to suit their own means, right, left, and all these things, yeah, um, which is not a good thing, yeah. So those I'm leaving to the other professors who very eloquently arg argued those things about left and liberalism and neoliberalism and et cetera. I'm not going to touch too, uh, too much upon that. Just about uh, Cardinal Newman and the idea of a university and what is the present thing about. I'm sure you'll have heard of something called um, Humboldtian, Humboldtian ideas, which is where the University of uh, Wilhelm Humboldt around uh, two, uh, 1900, early 1900s, that model was chosen by America to, uh, you know, to, and I'll, I'll read a quote, maybe that will be a little bit, uh, will give you an idea, to advance knowledge by original and critical uh, investigation, not just transmit the legacy of the past or to teach skills. Wonderful, isn't it? So he said that at that time, and that's what the universities followed and the research and the uh, academia were together, right? They said it was very much part of it. Then in the 70s and 80s came this polytechnic, right? Of specialization, vocational, skill-oriented. Of course, we need people to get jobs. We need the villages. It's a very different context in India. Yeah, uh, microcredit uh, uh, was uh, uh, the origins of microcredit in, this, in these regions, yeah? So what do we do about that? So tier two towns, tier three towns, and the rural and the you know divide. So let's not talk about only the elite and Shakespeare and stuff like that. First of all, that's not elite. There are different ways of engaging with Shakespeare. Uh, and she spoke about translation. Panamala spoke about translations. It's beautifully, even in that you can embed so many ideas about who you ought to be, even as you learn how, who you want to be and uh, how you engage with people. Yeah, and how you connect with people. And that's extremely important as we go forward uh, in our journey as human beings in the next 100 years. Um, education, yeah, well, in, uh, the, the British left used education for personal emancipation, right? Yeah, as if it's, you know, something that uh, um, status and stuff like that. And education for, edu uh, I mean, knowledge for knowledge sake was something that Cardinal Newman kind of implied on. Nothing wrong with it, pure sciences and everything. 
So therefore, you don't look at one silo and then just say critique the whole thing based on that. But there are both can exist, coexist. That's what I'm saying. In a university and academic setup, let's go now to the uh, part which is to do with um, uh, reinvention. Yeah, that that'll be yeah, great. As far as NEP is concerned, for me, it seems like you know the best lock, the lack all conviction and the worst are full of sound and fury, to quote uh, W.B. Yeats. Uh, they seem and sound eloquent, but there's no plan, which is how to execute that. It sounds great in theory, yeah, which is what Sridhara, uh, Professor Sridhara uh, alluded to. So when I look at my mind map and when I look at, very quickly, I'll take you through this. What does industry need? Empathetic leaders, empathic leaders, whatever you want to call it, need to persuade, inspire, influence, teach, need effective communication, need to know how to tell stories, need to engage with people, dialogue, need to present things well, need to write effectively, need to understand various types of people, emotions, nuances to get the best out of them, need to keep away biases, which is critical thinking, need to be self-aware, which is emotional quotient, need their products and companies to tell the right stories, need to build a culture, need to handle clients, which means sales talk, uh, uh, briefings, meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So if that is the need, tell me, today I, I, I'm a coach, right? I meet CEOs. One of the things they get anxious is because they cannot present well. And where did we go wrong? That's because he did his engineering. And after that, he did uh, Bombay IIT. And then he went to IIM Ahmedabad. And then he became a CTO in about three years. And he, and his wife tells him, your grammar is all bullshit. And you can't talk properly. And you're getting scared. And you don't know what to say. How does he move up the ladder? I'm just giving one example. There are millions of people like that. I, I've seen quite a lot in my uh, corporate career. Right? There are exceptions, of course. How? Because they did their language part. They, maybe they did it by default. They didn't know and they're saying, happy, oh, thank God I, you know, I picked up some of these things. Yeah? Language is fundamental to that, uh, that grounding. It's not something which is separate, uh, this or that. It's no question about that. Like somebody said in a four-year physics program, I can take a, a thing in conversational uh, German. I can take a course, a social worker needs language. How the hell will he, he or she communicate with the, the locals in Canada? Suppose I become a social worker and I'm from Bengal, right? These are important. So these are the bridge things which you did as a bridge things for English for Northeast people or people from regional language backgrounds. How did you do bridge courses in English, right? Phenomenal. Uh, Joseph did it. Similarly, if I have, for instance, yeah, I'll tell you now, uh, courses in, let's say, separately, Shakespeare for the salesman. Poetry, prose, writing, blogs, yeah? writing courses, speaking courses, nonverbal communication courses, business writing, yeah, uh, listening, storytelling courses, right? All part of the same department in any language. Okay. Um, here's another one which Sri Vidya inspired by Sri Vidya and her uh, thesis in uh, PhD. Language of film. Use only uh, 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 text, which is to do with film writing language of culture, language of dance, language of food, language of sport, yeah? And uh, what about having a center of excellence where leadership speak like a leader, write like a leader, English as, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, that I've spoken about that, already. culture training. So all these aspects of uh, what possibilities, huge possibilities, I could list it down. I'm randomly talking about it because I just thought I'll have a chat with you. So I think I've been speaking for some time now. And uh, lastly, I'll leave you before we come to the questions. Um, aesthetics is a very important part of language. If you don't have good taste, I don't think you'll get good anything uh, from people. And uh, at some point when they really look back and ask questions, it will lead to language related things. I'm, I'm using language loosely. They will say that this is what I heard from, this is what I read from. And I'm not uh, rooting out your great Dronacharis of the world who learned from experiential learning. Arjuna sits the apprentice. That's the type of learning. So can we transcend language? We transcend it all the time. When we cry with joy, when we hug, when we kiss, 
when we pat someone's back, yeah, that transcends language. Uh, you're speechless. There are no words to describe it. Be that as it may, language does play a huge, huge role in almost everything that we do, regardless of whether you're a mathematician or a scientist or cobbler, or furniture seller, <laughs> or a, a teacher or a, a chef. Yeah. And uh, the world of work, communication skills, speaking, writing, presenting, listening, connecting with team clients, etc. The world at large, relating, connection, appreciating, understanding, engaging. These are huge things. If you to learn together, I think we better learn to live together. And language is very, very, very key to that. And I think with a little bit of tweaking and readjustment and reinvention of the departments of language, all this can be done. It, it, it just needs a little bit of nuance. I mean, it just change it a little bit. It already exists. And it would be a grave, grave mistake to limit language uh, to just those two semesters, um, which is a very foolish thing, according to me. <laughs> any questions? Uh, so uh, thank you very much for patiently listening to me. Uh, it's getting late. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Uh, Naz, as usual, it was fantastic and lovely listening to you. Um, and, and you asked many of the questions that you know we get asked. Why do you need Shakespeare? if you're a science student, yeah? Why do you need language? Why do you need stories? Why do you need metaphors? Can't we live life without these things? And it's, uh, uh, it's so heartening to hear that, uh, you know, someone from outside with an industry perspective is also telling us how important it is to have language and how language is embedded in all cultures and how you cannot do away with it. You know, and how important it is therefore for people to understand, especially with the NEP in question, that languages is just not merely skill sets but something that you know is just part of our cultures it's just part of us and you can't really take away from there uh, i think uh, you know even uh, people like uh, Wit uh, wittgenstein said uh, you know the limits of my language mean the limits of my world right and bacon has also said knowledge of languages is the doorway to wisdom so it's it's funny that at one end we do harp on you know the past and traditions and things like that but then there is this gap between what is being said what was being said then and how we're going to put this into practice now right uh, so uh, thank you so much but uh, we'll open this conversation out uh, and we'll see if there are questions um, please post your questions on the chat box if there are questions from both the Zoom platform and the YouTube platform? Or if you have any comments that you'd like to make? You could also unmute and ask your question. Drishti, do we have any questions from the YouTube? Not so far. No. Uh, also, while we are waiting for questions, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, agree with uh, what you said, Naz, about how even pets these days are, if not trilingual or multilingual, at least bilingual, because I've experienced that. And they understand... I suppose in the languages we use, right? And and how important it is therefore for people to uh, you know be multi or uh, at least bilingual, uh, and 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 that's so important now. And when we're looking at the NEP doing away in quotes of languages as such. Uh, okay, uh, there's a comment from Mina. She says you left us speechless, Naz. <laughs> She's in the experiential mode. So thank you, Meena. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you're, you're in the mode where you don't need to say much. Yeah, <laughs> enjoy that. <laughs> okay. And, thank you. Uh, Jyotsna uh, says, so your truth and story parable is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, just make uh, uh, story into language. <laughs> That's the metaphor. Because I found it very, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, um, similar to what language can play the role of, you know, which is it's the mantle for everything, it seems like. 
the more you think about it, the more uh, it is relevant to everything that we do, intrinsic to everything that we do. True, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Nazarius, for the very energetic session, as usual. Uh, I just like to pick up on one of the implications of the things you were saying. You sort of referred to it glancingly at a certain point, right? Uh, the implication that I find very fascinating is that uh, the presence of language in the curriculum, in the undergraduate system, any system, right, uh, seems to sort of function as a zone, a quiet zone, where a kind of discovery of the self is possible. Right, and uh, in many ways, that zone of discovery is perhaps uh, uh, an underestimated thing in the ways in which educational planning happens. Right, uh, Fukuoka, in his One Straw Revolution, talks about how people, you know, uh, try to repair their roofs instead of looking at what they could do to prevent that damage from happening in the first place. In much the same way, the discourse of mental health today, right, ignores the fact that the, the substratum of what we call mental health is the discovery of the self through language, right? And so uh, if we want to look at solving this supposed epidemic of mental health that besets us, right, I think the smallest investment we could make is in the forms of self-discovery that are possible in poetry, song, film, theater, story, etc. Right? Uh, I found that uh, implication uh, very, very useful. And I'd like to thank you for that. Well, you're most welcome, sir. Uh, and you just triggered, that's a huge area, actually. When you look at a book by The Way, by Julia Cameron, She's very popular uh, as a uh, journalist. I mean, journaling. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. You should check it out at some point. Julia Cameron, okay? She was married to our great filmmaker, briefly, um, uh, the guy who makes uh, a taxi driver and all that. What's his name? Um, Robert Martin. Martin, Martin Scorsese. Scorsese. Yeah, Martin Scorsese. So Julia Cameron, in uh, uh, journaling, she uses it almost like a spiritual thing, what you spoke about, mindfulness. It's extremely useful. I use it in coaching for CEOs, okay, and for uh, younger people, okay, who are in the crossroads. Just journaling, which means your, uh, you call it collective consciousness, not collective consciousness, your own subconscious thing coming out first thing in the morning. We can teach these things when you uh, teach them journaling, you teach them fiction and writing. Write your own fiction, write your own story. What are your stories? they come to grip with, oh my God, I own this thing. And that's phenomenally powerful for mental health. And uh, you, to unleash your own gifts that you have and ultimately to reach your calling sooner than later. Well, thank you. Thank you. There's a question from YouTube. Yeah. I think the language of the heart is what everyone needs to understand each other right is the question to you. Isn't it the uh, language of the heart? <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, how could you disagree with uh, something like that? Uh, uh, yes, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, uh, what, what, what do we, how do we make meaning of this whole uh, uh, you know, existence, right? And ultimately, it will lead to something to do with uh, being something to do from your heart. But uh, psychologists warn us in uh, modern uh, <laughs> uh, cognitive uh, uh, theories, which is uh, don't go with what I what you calling gut feel unless you're about felt it for about ten years. Which means unless you're an expert, don't say this is my gut feel. You could be completely wrong. <laughs> so I shouldn't go with my mind. I should go with my heart or the old things. Uh, today's uh, psychology, uh, neuropsychology, talks about uh, don't go with that immediate feeling of thing. There's a lot more to it. But having said that. Daniel Col uh, uh, Goldman, who's the, uh, who's written the book about emotional quotient, always says, when you're taking decisions, there's a huge component for analytical thinking, but there's an equally uh, a big component for thinking through your emotions and your heart. And in that sense, yes, there's a good blend of both required. Uh, 
And yeah, I think that's yeah. important. Because that blending is what is important. Yeah. People today are talking about blending uh, offline and online uh, you know, <laughs> education. And yeah, blending always has its uh, positives. Uh, there's another question from Sam, and he wants to know what um, lang what has language to do with the Derridian deconstruction theory? Ah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, the, what was Derrida's uh, thoughts? It was uh, the postmodernist thought was that you can have multiple meanings. You cannot fix a meaning on it, right? And it is so true. It is like uh, going back to Rashomon, yeah? It's, uh, which is like uh, three different truths. So how do you define truth? How do you define uh, fact? Yeah, from uh, that side of the river, it looks very different. From on, when you're on the other side, it looks very different. Yeah. So these are things that we have to, when you're collaborating, you have to have the respect. Suppose you're from another culture, another religion, another language. How do I accommodate you? What is it that I have to do? So I have to find commonalities, not find differences between both of us, firstly. Okay. So the deconstruction theory in terms of languages, it's potent. At each time, when you say like, or even if you say take a word like fuck, it means so many nuanced things at the moment, right? And dynamic language we talk about in advertising. And if you go to UK now, you'll see a completely different language in smaller pockets where the Pakistanis live. And that English is very different from Yorkshire, for instance, yeah? And we are seeing culture and language uh, rapidly changing within our lifetime, within, within months and years, right? Uh, so in that context, yes, there is, uh, I agree with this theory. How is it relating to language? It is like, uh, you know, suppose I speak to you, if both of us understand and come from the same culture, we will find a bonding and a connection. Other people may not. Yeah. Other people might find some completely slightly different uh, meaning to the whole thing. So it will change. And depending on where you're standing, it will change. And that's good. And I'm saying that adds for the richness of meaning. Thank you, Ernest. There's another question from Bob Nathaniel. And the question is, how can higher education of uh, students create the nuance of being able to create a narrative in what they do and how they do it? Let me just look at that question properly. Uh, how can higher education students create the nuance of being able to... Create a narrative. Uh, higher education, you mean master students, right? Uh, could also be undergraduate, undergraduate. and postgraduate. Okay. Um, yeah, UG and PGs. There are many, many ways. You know, how, how do you create a narrative, <laughs> uh, you know? And uh, uh, let me give some examples. Yeah. So suppose you're, you're, you're doing science or you're doing the humanities. Okay, take, let's take two people. One's a girl, one's a boy. And you look at your interests, where are you coming from in terms of your culture, in terms of sport, music, and a, a combination of who are you? What is your talent? What is your skill? What is your gift? These are all very important questions that we can answer at some other point. Yeah? When you find those things, you bring to it a very unique combination of what you are going to be. And language is definitely a component, like I said, which is a fundamental uh, platform for you to uh, try out those nuances, to check those nuances, to build your what is known as taste, which is acquired or not acquired. What is art? What is culture? Uh, you know, um, how do you go about what is beauty? What is truth? These are all, there are no definitions, uh, straightforward definitions for all these things, right? Guys like Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, and a whole lot of them struggle with them. We still struggle with them, but it's an enjoyable pursuit to define it in the way you see it and to have the self-confidence that, yes, this is what I bring to the table. Don't forget that. In all those things where you're quoting other people, don't forget you bring value to the table. And when you come and say it in the simplest form, Expect it to be uh, taken uh, uh, for what its full value is and bring it that way. So that is what I think how you should uh, make it. Uh, narratives can be built up about who you are, the stories that you tell yourself. How could you change that narrative? Am I a middle class Brahmin, you know, who's, you know, because of my elders and forefathers, I'm still suffering. I know friends like that. He says, boss, I am the token Brahmin who comes for the interview and doesn't get the job. I've gone for some 50,000 interviews, right? How do, how do, is it a human thing to do to a guy who's about now 20 years old? 
we part, we are the same culture. We we talk about being tolerant, yeah, and so we shift suddenly from this side to that side. But I'm not taking away the fact how the Adivasis were treated and stuff like that. These narratives, you can engage with them from any point of view, from a physicist's point of view in terms of who your friends are and what. But of course, I'm not taking away the fact that you want to specialize. Please go ahead and specialize. But if you want a rounded view, just like medicine is doing these days, MBBS, not only the allopath, six months is given in Johns Hopkins University to medicine from the Aztec Indians, from Red Indians, from allopathy, uh, uh, homeopathy and Ayurveda. Yeah. Why are they doing that? Because they found virtue in that. In, uh, you know, of, they did not engage before because they said, oh, we're all scientists. We have evidence-based things. And they see the folly of a reductionist. Uh, uh, earlier speaker spoke about that, a reductionist way of looking at life. It is not reductionist at all. Human being itself is a complex, uh, uh, you know, holistic system. We cannot treat it separately. Sorry, my uh, long answer for a short question. Uh, there's another question. Could you give me an example of application for the management students? Uh, of language, that I, I presume he means. Management yeah. students, I told you, in management, what are you doing? You're dealing with people, right? You're dealing with sales. You're dealing with persuasion. You're dealing with influence. You're dealing with inspiring people. You're, de you're telling stories about the culture or the corporation or about your product, yeah? Or about competence or about what you can do for me and what I can do for you. Everything has to do with language, not just speaking it, but acting it sometimes in writing. Business uh, writing is very, very critical these days, right? Whether it's in promotion, whether it's in blogging, whether it's in uh, uh, writing your own stories about your own culture and your own company, even if somebody else does it, you have to have the vision for that, right? And that is through language. How do you see these concepts? You, if you can express it, you, you need not be the best expressionist of that, uh, of that idea. But, uh, you know, if, uh, language gives you the skill to at least go to these places, you know? Ah, I remember Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. He felt like this, wow, that's interesting how that guilt of, you know, killing that man and not knowing, and that was his crime. Phenomenal. There are many, many more instances. I'm just saying because of my biases towards these things in the past, okay? You can take it from a musical point of view, dance point of view, which, you know, are phenomenal worlds there for you to discover. I think uh, as management students or, or business students these days, you, they also need to understand the language of ethics, how important it is to, to have ethics when you deal with management or business, right? And not just talk about profit and capitalism. What do you think, Anas? The biggest thing, the, one of the biggest things that we know about brands is today that you have to be authentic, right? Otherwise, the world will reject you. We have moved on from the age of industrialization, information age to digital and social, right? Shared economy is something we talk about. In shared economy, a lot of things have to be given free. And you cannot tell me something and push my brand in front of your face. You have to tell me stories about, and I have to like you. Only then I'm going to like your brand. So you have to be much more eloquent, <laughs> whether it is whatever the language you're using or symbolic stuff that you're using. Thank you, Ness. Uh, do we have any more questions? I think... Uh, uh, while we're here, I'd just like to make an announcement. There's an addition to the program tomorrow. Uh, at 5.30, we have Mr. Sripad Bhatt uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, Indian languages and the new education policy. He'll be speaking in Canada. There'll be a synoptic summary in English after he finishes. But before that, at 4.30, we're... Uh, glad to announce that we've been able to fine-tune a question that had been articulated at the beginning of this colloquium. Uh, one of the questions I asked is, who is the intended recipient of the NEP? Uh, apart from the urban, mobile, upper-class, upper-caste individual, right? To fine-tune that question and to take it a little further, we have a panel of Dalit students and uh, scholars looking at the NEP and giving us uh, their perceptions and their understanding of what its lacunae might be, what its advantages might be. Uh, Professor Vijeta will be moderating the panel. We have uh, uh, Sylvia Karpagam, uh, Dr. Sylvia Karpagam, the medical doctor and public health activist joining the panel. Professor B.Y. Rajendra from the Department of Social Work, 
Uh, and I'm also glad to report that we have the students joining us. Uh, we have uh, Win uh, Vincent, uh, from, who was a student at the Evening College and is now a teacher at a PUC college, uh, joining us tomorrow, as also Calvin Mike. Right? So we look forward to that panel and its deliberations as well, since we didn't put it on the original schedule, uh, just telling everybody here about it. That's at 4.30 tomorrow. Hope to see you here for both programs. All right. Thank you, Dr. Arul. Um, so I'd uh, like to thank uh, uh, Nazarius Manoharan for this very enlightening, enlightening and, and enriching talk, discussion, dialogue that we've had. Metaphors are definitely more than figures of speech because they influence concepts as well as modes of expression. And it is languages, therefore, that make these metaphors powerful. And it is languages that help us to be inclusive and languages to help us to hold truth to power. On that note, I will conclude and uh, uh, we meet again tomorrow at the colloquium. We meet at 4 or 4.30, uh, like uh, Dr. Arulmani said. So thank you everyone for being a part of this day four and see you tomorrow. Bye.